Uh, Jimmy, this is very exciting. We're here with the new Allen & Heath D-Live, but while it's uh, really easy to get distracted by all the bells and whistles on the control surface, we both know that all the action is happening over here. You can in unplug the this and that keeps working. <laughs> well, that's very useful. Okay, so, you know, effectively the D-Live is, uh, the control surface is really just a big remote because all of the action's happening in here. Yeah. Now, so we've got three sizes of mix rack available, all running at 96K. Yep. With 32, 48, or 64 inputs. And, and exactly half as many analog outputs yeah. corresponding to your inputs. Yeah, that's right. And uh, also a bunch of different connectivity in terms of uh, Alan Heath's proprietary format, uh, personal mixing, and some expansion cards as well. Yeah, so if you decide that, say, 64 inputs is not enough, you can use the DX32 Expander, which is a four-slot device. Each slot supports eight channels of audio, whether they're inputs or outputs, analog or stereo AES, mm. uh, and you can connect up to two of those, and they connect using paired DX link cables, uh, which is just you know, Cat6 cables, as far as I can tell. Um, and so you've got main and redundant. And speaking of main and redundant, you've got options for dual power supplies mm. in all of this stuff, and they're hot swappable too. Mm. Um, the link between the mix rack and the surface is dual redundant as well. So mm. there's some good redundancy going on at many levels. Yeah. Now that's the kind of thing that elevates the D-Live into like extremely high level of professional. Pretty pro, isn't it? Yeah, very pro. I mean, hot swappable power supplies, dual redundant everything, and um, 64 mix buses. And I think that's one of the key things about mm. this product. Where is that going to put it for you? Well, this is the thing. You can you can buy a digital mixer from pretty much you know anybody for pretty much any size of gig until you start getting above 24 buses, mm. where your market goes from that big and with a range of prices to about that big with a price. And your prices go like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that's why I actually think... Actually, the prices go like <laughs> They that. do. And I think that's why this is going to be actually quite yeah, disruptive. It's pretty good value. You can't get this much bang for, for this much buck pretty much anywhere. And 64 mix buses is that magic number where you're getting into the bigger worship applications. You're mm. getting into musical theatre. Musical theatre for mm. me. Yeah, so anywhere where you've got lots of people on in-ear monitors or lots of sends to different places and you know lots of talent to look after. And then with the amount of inputs you can actually get into the thing, there's not a lot of gigs this thing can't do. No, um, we've got, uh, as you mentioned, quite a, a lot in the way of expandability options. The other thing that I think is really cool is that um, for what is a very large and very functional console, the latency on it is extremely low. Yes, measured it very low. I measured it at 0.7 milliseconds. Mm, yeah, and this was unheard of even a few years ago. That's yeah. extraordinarily low. Um, so, you know, that's that's not likely to cause you an issue. No, no. Uh, I, I certainly can't. you got word clock terminals as mm. well, so you got some options there for clocking. Mm. Um, and we've got these uh, I.O. ports, which mm. I'm going to just call card slots because it's what they are. Mm. Uh, and they support 128 channels each. Mm. Um, so you've got various options there, things like Dante mm. um, and other cards. Uh, we should talk about the Surface, because yeah. that's also available in three different flavours. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, we're here with the 28 uh, Fader Bank version, Yep. Uh, but there's a 20 and a 36 as well. Correct. The 20, you lose one screen. Yeah, okay. And the screens, for instance, worth talking about. Um, they've got a lot of very common now touch. Yeah, multi-touch. Like pinch. You can do pinchy things. Yep. So if you're on your patching screen, you can zoom mm. by pinching in and out. That's mm. pretty cool. Yeah, obviously quite a customizable setup. You can set rotary encoders to do different things. Yeah, you've got row, rows of encoders down the side of mm. each screen. These you can have three different sets of functions on each. Mm. And I like that you can now put uh, your auxiliary sends on the encoders rather than just flip them onto the faders mm. as the only option. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, I like that this reset function is here. You can hold that and then just tap a channel parameter mm. and that sets it back to its default values. Mm. Look, there's a lot of cool stuff in the way that you interact with this console. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've only got really minor quibbles with the ergonomics of it. Like, for, for instance, I love the fact there's a go button. Most manufacturers leave that but out. You don't like where it is. I would have put it down there, but then again, I'm right-handed and a left-handed operator would want it on the other side. So I wonder you, you if you can win. use one of these user yeah, keys. Yeah, of course you can. I, I checked. You can. There yeah, you go. Which is exactly what I do. I'd have it. Your down comment there. is invalid. <laughs> my comment is that I'd like to be able to swap the screens that around would, so I see all my good. channel stuff in the middle. Yeah, that, that's actually a fair point, I think. But I mean, it's just minor stuff because I mean, apart from that, there's just so much cool stuff. Like, I love the listen function. Press that and you can tap on any part of a signal so you can listen to a channel's compressor you know you can listen yeah. to what you just just what that component is speaking doing. of compressors and stuff I mean we've got 16 effect slots but we've also got the option on every channel for dynamics to choose from a couple of different types of, of 
algorithm, which they've put these cool interfaces on, which look very reminiscent of some other compressors <laughs> you might have seen. I'm sure it's coincidence. It's, I'm mm. sure it's entirely coincidental, but mm. it's very cool. Um, and look, I, I think this represents to me, because I don't know if you remember the original, yeah. when ILI first came yeah. out, I didn't like it. Neither um, did I, to be honest. It was clunky and it was expensive, mm. but they refined the, mm. they refined it and, and they did well with it, mm. and, and it became quite a good platform, and mm. I've done a lot of gigs on ILI, so it's very familiar to me now, mm. and it's mm. kind of like a friend. So this, this was like a new friend, mm. but one that I already kind of knew. Yeah, look, I think this is a fantastic example of a manufacturer learning over a period of I years. I agree, I agree. They've and taken then, a lot of their yeah. existing console building lessons and even they've taken things from their little consoles yeah. like the Q series has these same nice mute buttons yeah. and, and they're much nicer than the hard plastic mm. keys of the previous generation so mm. what they've done here is they've taken the best of everything they've done so far mm. and made it better yep okay well it's all about the buses for me and I think it's just unbeatable for for the price that it is yeah look it's for me I think it's about the usability and it's a it's a pretty big win on both counts really yeah, isn't it yeah. well done Alan and Heath Thank you so much for watching Gearbox. If you like what you saw, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos, don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking below. We'll see you next time.